All right, so in the last video, we took this Commodore SX64 apart all the way down to its constituent components. And then I got on a plane, went to Spain, met family I'd never met before, saw the church where my great-great-grandparents were married in 1912, came home, got sick, and now I gotta restore it and get it all put back together. Not a fan of leaving something that I've never worked on before apart for two or three weeks before getting back to it, but that's life. So let's get to it. One thing I was unaware of in the first video was that there are two types of chassis and the difference is in how the floppy drive is mounted. So if you look at the images, you'll see the difference. The other type is an earlier type, I believe. It's a lot more difficult to get the floppy drive out. The older type requires that you remove the main board and CRT to access the screws to remove the floppy drive. And you can see here that the drive is mounted with the screws in sideways. That's just something to be aware of. I will put this in the removal and replacements document so click on that in the link below if you want to see how to take that out. Taking a first look at the frame, it is just nasty. It's just, there's crud all over it and it feels like it was wet. It doesn't really show up well in the video, but I think condensation formed over the decades. So the, the dust had settled, condensation had formed and cement it down and more was added. So now it's time for some serious cleaning. So let's get to it. I'll also start out by hitting all the controls with some contact cleaner. I prefer a BW100 contact cleaner instead of deoxid because it doesn't leave a residue behind. You know, I don't think deoxid would cause any problems, but I do know there are some Tektronix oscilloscopes out there with knobs that can be badly damaged by it, so better safe than sorry. There's a lot of cleaning needed on the frame and the case parts. I really love this style of restoration though. Once the frame is clean, it forms the nucleus of the restoration, and as each subassembly gets restored and added back to the frame, I can really feel like I'm making progress. Each part is getting cleaned with Windex and a detailing brush in order to really get the grime out of those many small spaces it can hide in. But once a part is clean, it gets wiped down with a cloth and inspected. When I'm happy with the result, the part is rinsed in warm water, except in cases where the item is not water tolerant, like the frame with all the harness wires and the control board. Each part is then blown off to remove the bulk of the water and then allowed to dry in the warm summer sun. Finally, for most restorations, including this one, I treat all the plastic covers with Aerospace 303 to give them a nice shine and protect from UV rays that can degrade some plastics. The first thing I noticed after removing the power supply was the extreme rust on the RF shield. Man, this thing is nasty. After removing three screws, it just slides to the side to remove. Fortunately, the board doesn't look like it was exposed to as much moisture as the RF shield. To remove the power supply board, you first have to remove the connector PCB that has the user port, joystick ports, serial port, and video out port. The board looks to be in pretty good shape, but we'll have to do a modification to it before reinstalling. More on that in a minute. Uh, the power supply board is held in by eight screws, five on the board itself and three on the heat sinks. You also have to remove this metal shield to access one of the screws. The thermal paste between the heat sinks is completely dried out, so much so that it just flaked off as I was removing it. I gave the cast heat sink a good cleaning and also cleaned the residual thermal paste off the circuit board's aluminum heat sink. To deal with the extreme rust on the RF shield, I really don't have any choice but to go with the last resort and paint it. My method of dealing with extreme rust like this is to first sand as much of the surface rust off as I can with fine sandpaper. In this case, I'm using a 220 grit. Once the piece feels smooth to the touch, it's cleaned with soap and water followed by alcohol to ensure there is no grease or oils which would interfere with the next step. Then I treat the piece overnight with a rust converter. 
In this case, I'm using fur tan because I'm going to paint it and fur tan converts the rust into a paint ready material. Finally, after cleaning off all the residual fur tan, it gets a good coat of high zinc paint and looks great. Now all that needs to be done is to reassemble everything in reverse order. The heat sink gets a good coat of thermal paste and yes, it's a lot. There's a large surface area to cover and the gap between the parts is much more than you would have with something like a CPU heat sink. Everything else looks good upon inspection, so all that needs to be done is to make that little mod to the connector board. So the connector PCB, as I said earlier, needs a modification, and there is a flaw on this board introduced by Commodore. And the best way to see it is using a meter, so we're just set for sound, these two pins are shorted together and they should not be shorted together that is ground and 9 volt AC and if we set this aside and take a look at the ZIF 64 same two pins no connection so definitely an issue there so some devices like my Promenade C1 EEPROM burner reply on this power supply and using them on an unmodified SX64 is likely to cause serious damage to the machine per this letter from the Promenade's manufacturer, which I found on Ray Carlson's website. No, seriously, if you don't know about Ray Carlson's website, I'll put a link below. The sophisticated method for fixing this is to simply cut this trace between these two pads. That was an error in the circuit board design. So cut a few times, double check. Sometimes you don't get all the way the first time, as I have not, so we gotta go deeper. So that connection's been removed, and we can go back to here and double check there and there no longer have a connection between those pins so we should be golden simple little fix but really important i really don't consider this a mod i consider this a repair it's fixing a factory defect all right and there we go power supply is ready to go back in the frame our first assembly is good to go turn the ground screws which i left in here so i couldn't lose them which I'd done that with a few more things had I known it would have been a month between disassembly and reassembly. But, hey, is what it is, right? And there it is. The power supply is ready to go. So let's move on to the next assembly. Okay, so the floppy drive needs to be cleaned and lubricated before it can be tested. So I'm sure you could take an SX64 uh, drive and plug it into a 1541 and just test it on the bench, but the wiring is completely different. You got three connectors that go on the board. This connector has a ton of empty space. This one, which is exact same connector, but it has no empty spaces. These two have been eliminated. So I can't just take this and plug it onto the board, sadly. But for now, I'm just gonna have to go with testing it once we get the SX64 finished and put together. So that is what it is, I guess. Fortunately, the SX64 has the more reliable Alps drive mechanism, so there's room for optimism. Just knocking the bulk of the dust out of it. That should be fine. And now I am going to do a bunch of cleaning. And some of these have uh, air conditioner running in the background. It's uh, over 100 today. Was that 40 Celsius? Either way, it's hot. All right, 
very important to get these rails cleaned. You remember when we took this apart, it was quite stuck. This is still very stiff. So now what I'm going to do, a little bit of white lithium grease and a clean Q-tip. Doesn't take a whole lot. Less is more when it comes to lubricants. I'm going to put a little bit on the rails, right where the sled can uh, distribute it. This is already making a huge difference. My gosh. This is now moving quite nicely. And so, all right, we just need to clean up the heads with alcohol on a Q-tip and return the storage bin to where it goes. That is ready to go back into the frame. Figured while I'm at it, I should go ahead and get the front cover on. There's a couple of screws that go down in under the drive. Floppy drives in. Next up, CRT. By far, my biggest weakness in machines like this is the CRT. I do work on them if I have to, but I use a lot of caution and don't go crazy tearing everything apart if it's not required. In this case, I'm not going to do much more than a quick inspection and cleaning. Once a machine is reassembled, I can re-remove it easily enough if there are any problems. It's just four screws. So upon inspection, there's one cap that has some corrosion on one leg. Caps of this era are usually pretty good and they very rarely leak. So for the time being, I'm only going to replace that one cap. Let's go here. Those are soldered on. All soldered on, so we're not coming any further out than that unless I want to unsolder it, which I do not. Let me take a good close look at all the other capacitors. To get a good look at the rest of the caps, I needed to remove the RF shield, and the screws were so tight that I had to use a pair of vice grips to grasp the head and crack it loose. Even though I tried several screwdrivers and could not budge the screws, they were very easy to break loose this way. I just don't prefer this method because it leaves marks on the edges of the screws. With the RF shield removed, I got a good look at all the other caps and everything's looking great. So for the time being, I'm only going to replace and test the one cap. As usual, I start by adding a little fresh solder to the old part. And I'm going to use my little engineer. These are great little uh, solder suckers. Um, it's not worth breaking out the big one for two joints. Let's test this cap real quick. Cap tests good. It's hard to tell if it's actually leaking. I think it just got something dripped on it. So, I need a... 10 microfarad, 16 volt cap. 10 microfarad, 16 volts. Used for the C64 RF modulator, apparently. Well, if anybody is looking for a way to organize capacitors to have less density in your storage, I just get these bags off of eBay, anti static, label them with a label maker. So, this is basically. 0 to 999 nanofarads it's all in one little tray. This used to take so much space. Now that the cap's been replaced, we'll just put everything back together and we'll see how it does in the testing. Everything looks pretty good. I don't mess with monitors as much as I can avoid it anyway. Uh, monitors can do bad things and they're very testy so I do not want to mess with it any more than I have to again especially for me when I'm dealing with CRTs less is more if I have problems I will come back and do what I need to do to fix them but pretty happy with how it looks looks like this is a reasonably 
low-use machine that just sat there forever. cleaned up just carefully with a little tiny bit of alcohol and a q-tip. I cleaned some of the rather copious dust that was sitting in the bottom of the speaker where it was sitting against the ground. Um, and it's a paper cone speaker so I really don't want to do much with it but a little tiny bit of alcohol that dries quickly shouldn't hurt anything. If you want it to get good and black, I have read online, but I've never tried it, that you can just hit it with some India ink or something, but that is just fine. Just facing up, it collects a lot of dust. And then uh, we went ahead and cleaned the screen. These little clips are a bit of a pain to get off. They've got two little ears that fit in a slot between the glass and the plastic on the front. And then just a slight lip on the back that snaps into place over the plastic. So you kind of have to work those out. I worry about putting too much pressure on the glass, but it was fine. Uh, plenty of dust inside the glass. You know, CRTs, they high voltages, they attract a lot of dust. So I am going to reattach this board lightly. And the reason I'm not really getting it fully installed is because I know I'm going to need to pull it loose to reattach the wires when I install this in the frame. So I'm just returning the two screws that I had in it earlier and we will see where we're at after we get this reinstalled. I'm hoping it's working fine as is but if not we can always pull it back out it's just four screws so that's ready to go back in the frame. Woohoo! So to get this back in, you got to get it back in here and then there is an ear right here that has to go through a slot right there to get past the floppy mounting. So we're just going to drop it in that way, then drop it down and then slide it forward. And I'm going to double check, make sure I'm not sitting on any cables, which would be really easy to do right in this corner. And that is just fine. The screw holes all look perfectly lined up. And so now we will put the screws back in. One thing I should point out too with these screws is if you've got four screws to put in or multiple screws to put in and one of them's in a little tunnel where you're likely to lose it, do that one first. So great, just hooking the wires back up the same place they came from. For this, the markings come in quite handy. And the CRT is reinstalled. It's starting to look like a machine again. Wow, this thing has taken way longer than I ever dreamed it would. This machine is complex, it's got a lot of parts, but it's coming along. However, this video is getting way too long at this point, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here. I'll put the next part right up here as soon as it's ready. And in the meantime, check out this video where I fixed a Commodore 64 that had over a dozen bad ICs. Thanks for coming.